Okay, why don't you guys answer this and then we we'll take more? You want to answer it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's an excellent point that there's very little um, programmatic debate um, in politics. I'm, I, you know, ever since I started looking at campaigns in Brazil, I've really been struck by that. Um, it's certainly not the only Latin American country, but um, definitely starting, you know, in 2002 and going forward, there there's not much disagreement between the major candidates. I mean, you know, Bolsonaro really is a really you know, um, a, a strong uh, example of this. I mean, can you imagine the United States candidates fighting over who, you know, over Obamacare or Social Security or we invented that? No, we invented it. No, we really had the precursor of that. You just branded it. I mean, this is you know, social. Yeah, it's just social. Well, okay, fine, but but they don't sort of fight over the origin. Well, they need to take credit for it. Right? Yeah, I mean, this is a social. Program. Program that the leading left, you know, the leading right wing, the leading left wing candidate are fighting over, you know, who really invented it and gets responsibility for it, and and tripping over each other to say they're going to extend it rather than cut it. And so, you know, um, it, you know, it's interesting. I've also been following Pastor Ronaldo's campaign just because I'm interested in the evangelicals. Is the guy that's in the one percent in the polls? He's the actual programmatically right wing candidate who talks about shrinking the state and you know, sort of doing all these things that we associate with the, with the economic right, in addition to the values uh, issues, positions that he takes. And he's at 1% of the polls, right? And so there isn't that much um, programmatic debate. Now, who is this third sector that, that Vicky um, asked? I mean, I don't, I don't know if this makes sense to describe this as a sector. You have the, the PSB, which until a few months ago was part of the PT government coalition, right? Um, and. Um, you know, it's not so clearly a separate group. You know, you've got, you know, Marina is the core of this third sector that we're referring to, but, you know, Marina is kind of an individual phenomenon who, you know, has migrated to a whole bunch of different parties in the past. She was with the PT and then she left that. She was with the, the Green Party and then she left that and then she tried to start this new, you know, hedgy uh, party and that didn't work out and then, and then now she's with the PSB and, and, and I just don't see this sort of really adding up to a separate sector. And then. You know, the, the final point that I make, and I have to respectively, um, respectfully disagree with Professor Fishlow on this, that, um, that um, a Marina presidency might, um, that we have strong reasons to believe that it's going to be less um, uh, engaged in corruption. I think people would have really, a lot of people would have said the same thing about the PT in the late 1990s. Um, I think that this is really systematic. I think it's about how you govern in Brazil. I mean, what was the Mensal Lao? Mensal Lao was um, a method of cementing a governing coalition. It was illegal payments to allied party members to vote with the PT. Um, building a coalition that allows you to govern in a political system in which there's so many parties that at best you get 20% of the seats in Congress for your own party, you've got to pull together these supermajority coalitions. That's structural in Brazilian politics. And moreover, Marina, if she wins, is going to have many fewer seats within the PSB, which even isn't even really her party, than the PT has at present. She has to build a coalition to govern. It has to be a supermajority coalition. That's how you govern in Brazil. How can you do this? You can do it by handing out ministries. You can do it through various political favors that are legal. But there are also various forms of corruption that often help in cementing those coalitions. And you know the temptations are there. Yeah. You guys want to add anything here? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Much. Thank you. This one uh, question. Uh, I agree that it would be good to have a third possibility. The Brazilian people perhaps is already tired of uh, voting PT or PSDB. The question is, uh, that's the question that Victoria made, is really uh, Marina a third position, a third option? Uh, I think her force is very strong because she seems to be, but I'm not sure if she is. Uh, in order to ensure uh, governability, she will have to uh, approach PSDB. It's inevitable, like he said. Uh, to build, she will have to build a coalition. It was difficult for Lula already. For her, it would be much uh, more uh, difficult. So she will have to make a coalition, and of course with PSDB. Her, uh, the team of her economists are, uh, as, I, as I said, very uh, intelligent ones, very important ones. Some of the guys who made the Plano Real, the Real Plan. I mean, I, I, I can't see much difference between uh, Marina and PSDB. Of course, PT is similar in a certain way too, with more, a little bit more uh, investment of the state, uh, uh, 
a little bit more uh, social sensibility, I, I think. But in fact, um, we have uh, three possibilities of mais do mesmo, like, like we say all, always in Brazil, more of the same. And I think that uh, the manifestations of the last year meant that we don't want, we don't, or many people in Brazil do not want any more mais do mesmo, more of the same. And I don't think uh, Marina will break that, uh, will break that uh, duality of, of power. I think, uh, for instance, uh, I'm very, uh, I, I remember uh, once uh, talking to French economists who, uh, who lived in, uh, in Brazil in the 60s. And, he, and what's his name? The Polish guy who, who works in Colombo. Uh, well, I, I, I forgot his name now. Sachs. In a six Sachs. And he, he told me, it's unbelievable. The Brazilian model of agribusiness that we fought against it in, in the 60s, now is an example for the world. Uh, it's the social conditions of, work, of uh, rural workers in Brazil were terrible. That's perhaps because we can compare it with China. I, I mean, uh, I, we cannot separate uh, economic product productivity of uh, welfare of the people. And the question is in Brazil is how to do the both things economic growth and welfare of the people. I think that's the, uh, our uh, problem, and, and that's difficult to solve. Perhaps I, one could argue that sex was wrong, and that's why that's become a model, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is easier to argue. So let's look at some data, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's true, of course, rural conditions in Brazil are very poor, but when you look at the areas where the agribusiness is successful, in the areas of, of corn and soybean and sugar, the conditions are much better than they are in other areas. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in fact, if you take, Brazil has this, um, has done this, this index of social welfare, which are done all over the world. Brazil has done it at the municipality level, as you know. So you can go to, 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 to a specific uh, municipality of Brazil and ask what's the level of social economic welfare it's the index that everybody, all these countries do at the same time. We've done it in Brazil as a municipality level. Now, if you took all the areas that in which, if you, if you aggregate the, the areas that produce the majority of soybeans, and 60% of the areas, in the areas which are responsible, but 60% of the production of soybeans, which are of course the areas in which soybeans are more present, and you aggregate that, you get Paraná. You get the same, which is one of the richest states in Brazil. So you get a population similar, you get a, an area which is similar, but which has the same um, uh, level of social welfare as Paraná. Okay. So that kind of serves an equality education center. So this idea that agribusiness in Brazil has been an industry that's caused people to be poor is just not borne by the data. It's, it's by the ideology. There's no facts in that. I mean, I have a kind of follow-up on that. Uh, the most, and I'll, I'll leave you there, but the most efficient sector in productivity in Argentina is the agribusiness as well. Yeah. And the explanation, I think, has to do with the point that Al brought, which is the commodity boom. So the Chinese are demanding the soybean, you know, there's corn and stuff. And, and you know, regulations in Argentina are not to promote productivity in the agribusiness sector, let me tell you. These guys are efficient despite a bunch of regulations which have exactly the opposite goal. And so to what extent is this really, you know, if this is a policy, what will happen? Because it seems to me that these guys, you know, didn't do something so well or bad. I mean, they just benefit from Look, the commodity both boom Argentina, no, no, and the point that wrong Al brought. You're wrong about this, because both Argentina and Brazil have made big te technological developments in agriculture. There's not much difference between what the Embrapa did and what he did in Silicon Valley. It's the same process. It's the process of creating knowledge. And I know a little bit less about Argentina, but I know that in Argentina, my, my friends, Argentinian economists, tell me that in Argentina, they also made a lot of technological progress. Now, it's true that policies in Argentina are extremely bad. I once asked uh, one of the largest, as you may know, most sugar traded internationally is produced in Brazil. So I asked one of the largest, the largest sugar producers in Brazil, I said, what, how come other countries can't produce sugar like Brazil does? And he said, Argentina could. 
but thank God they have that government. Mm -hmm. So it is true that the policies really sometimes destroy the capacity of production. But Argentina is so productive in that area that even those policies have not been able to do. Um, you don't measure, you don't measure uh, productivity by looking at the price that China is willing to pay for something. That's not how we measure productivity, right? We measure productivity, how much you produce, so just, just to, to give an idea of the impact of Embrapa. Brazil today produces 10 times the amount of, you know, 8 times the amount of corn that used to produce in the same area. That's a good story about people thinking that, that every business is taking over all land in Brazil. It was exactly the same area, but it produced eight times as much corn. So how do you do that? It's not that China's price are high. It's because they have a technology to produce eight times as much. They would have produced before. If you can use the same area to produce eight times as much, you're going to do it in any case, right? Okay, we're done. I, I, I'd like to talk uh, a little bit more about the politics now, if I could, for just a minute, because in, in, in some ways, I think there's almost unanimity of opinion about what has to be done on the economics. That in, in a curious fashion, uh, there's a high degree of agreement among intelligent people about the need for more savings domestically, about the need for higher rates of investment that have to occur, about a higher rate of exports to the rest of the world and a higher degree of trade uh, to exist, uh, etc. Uh, I think the politics is more important because in a way that's what is at the root. You've got 39 cabinet ministers uh, in Brazil at the present time. Uh, one more and you get Alibaba. Uh, but, uh, I think that's what's saving Yes. <laughs> you uh, have uh, a, uh, you have 28 or 29 uh, parties you have 22 or 23 parties with representatives at the present time uh, in the Congress. Uh, no other country can make that claim. Uh, and what it leads to is a total inability to uh, be able to uh, have a change. Uh, Gilma, uh, herself is in favor of change, but was forced off of that in many ways by members of the PT who understand that uh, their position is strong at the moment precisely because of the division of opinion which enables them to wield together the particular power that they've been able to do. Uh, remember that Marina has already said that she's going to restructure the government. Uh, Marina has already said that she wants to move to a system in which there is a presidency for five years and no re-election. Uh, Marina has uh, already said that uh, she uh, is prepared uh, to bring in members for the cabinet of existing parties rather than from her own party in a central position. And it seems to me that uh, this is where the change has to occur that uh, so long as one is dealing with this very complicated political structure, sooner or later in the absence of uh, a, uh, another commodity boom or uh, petroleum, it turns out that petroleum is not going to serve that purpose uh, simply because fracking in the U.S. and the ability to produce natural gas so much more cheaply has changed the nature of the petroleum market. And the U.S. is going to be in a dominant position in uh, this market in the future. 
and the price of petroleum, according to various estimates, suggests that the price of petroleum is going to stay between 80 and 90 dollars a barrel, rather than continue to go up as it had gone up in the past. So uh, it, it seems to me at the heart of the matter is precisely the need for a real plan in politics. Uh, the real plan finally managed to get Brazil on the right track, in which you've got the same currency and you're dealing with continuity. People have expectations about what's going to happen. The same thing is necessary within the political sphere. Otherwise, you're always going to come round the circle in one way or another and prevent the process from yielding a result. Okay. Yes. Over there. At the end? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, basically, Professor Fischlow just mentioned, like, the greatest part of what I would say. Uh, I, I also believe, I mean, I truly believe that political uh, a political change in Brazil is needed. Uh, I don't see it as likely to happen with Marina because she needs she needs governability and she needs to get together with PMDP, and then it will be very hard for her to push that. She's not she's not very strong to push that. So my question uh, is is on the future, is on the unfolding of this here in the election. I don't see either Dilma or Marina pushing this sort of political revolution of this sort of political real plan. Uh, I don't see it happening in the next four years. Uh, we saw huge protests in Brazil in the past year, uh, and it's likely that this will continue if the current situation continues. The picture of Brazil that presenters here presented is very sad, actually, uh, because we don't see we don't see an exit for that. So I would like to know the opinion uh, from the presenters on how this can unfold. Uh, if there is, how, where Brazil will go in the end, I mean, why you see we going? This is easy to see for some countries, as Greece, they, they usually go to the right side, or in Europe, that's what happened on the past uh, elections, like they went to the right wing, but in Brazil, our voters are centered, and we, we never saw this before, actually. Uh, so I would like to know the opinion of the presenters on where we will go. Thank you. Uh, I had just a question in the face each of you could probably answer in your own perspective. Um, just to, what do you think um, will be sort of the deciding constituency of voters uh, in the second round? And what would be the kind of the key issue uh, that will decide the vote? Um, and I think, you know, historically the VT has been more, has had a, sort of kind of a, a more middle class base, and then, you know, from the period of Lula's first election to, um, the last presidential election, there's been a very radical change in sort of the base of support. You know, the, the lower, the lower class being kind of the base of support of PT. Um, so I'm wondering if you think that that group will be sort of the deciding factor in this vote, and which way they, they might go. You know, is, is PT going to continue having that support, and maybe will that switch over to, to Marina? Um, and so, what, you know, I'm wondering if, if you know, what the constituents will be, and what the what the key issues will be. I think that we, we narrowed it down to two candidates, there'll probably be one or two touch, you know, key issues that will we'll sort of frame the debate. Yes. Hi. I'm just a little bit about uh, relationship with the private sector and foreign investment. And usually when there are elections in the presidential levels, the markets are kind of expected uh, if there's going to be any change or how the dynamics are going are gonna to change with the new administration. So I wanted to ask, if you see, if Marina wins, do you see a change in the relationship between foreign investment and which areas or which aspects will be affected? Yes. Uh, my question is somewhat related to what you mentioned before. I'm very interested in the intersection of class and race in this election. And I raise that because as evidence from the clip that you showed, Marina has been very powerful in, in projecting her personal narrative in the last stages of this campaign. And in doing so, the symbolism of her ascension now as a top contender, as a woman and as a person of mixed race in Brazil, is not lost. How is race manifesting? Uh, in, in this election, and is, will that at all play out in her appeal to the base in the Northeast? Thank you. Okay, so I get back to the presenters. You want to start the other way around? I want to start first. 
Let me start with the notion that 